Ephesians bonus video number eight, submission, wives, children, and slaves first. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he was very clear. The life of a follower of Jesus should be very different from the life of someone who does not follow Jesus. He told us to live as children of light in a dark world, and we should take off the old person and then put on a new person. Christians, Christians live moral, ethical, spirit-controlled lives in front of non-Christians who live controlled by their evil desires. Uh, you and I, we get rid of things like bitterness, rage, sexual immorality, while at the same time displaying self-control, humility, and love. In Ephesians 5.15, Paul summed up the reason for all this when he said, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So what was Paul's point? Paul's point was, live so you make the most of every opportunity. But then he tacked on sort of a surprise instruction in verse 21 when he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, there's probably no word that flies in the face of our American culture than the word submit. Uh, our society emphasizes individual expression and the cult of personality. We're focused on personal gain, personal successes, personal advancements. How many likes do you have for your picture on Instagram? And then in the corporate world, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. And also think about the conflict we've studied at Ephesus. Uh, Jewish Christians thought they were superior and should get their own way. Well, Gentile Christians thought they were superior and they should get their own way. And Paul confronted both of them. He confronted them when he said it was through humble submission where Christians stand out from those. When everyone surrendered their desires and demands, they looked like Jesus, and they looked less like the culture around them. Sure, submission isn't popular. Voluntarily giving up your rights and your privileges, it isn't easy. It's not natural. Actually, it's supernatural. It's what happens when you are filled with the Spirit of God instead of being filled, well, instead of being full of yourself. And to explain mutual submission, both parties surrendering their ideas and their ideals up for the other, Paul gave three examples of this submission. So let's stop before we go any further. And I have to acknowledge the difficulty and controversy associated with Paul's three examples. Some people are offended by these words. People disagree about what Paul meant or whether, he should even, whether we should even follow these examples today. And it's, it's more than an interpretation issue. People have horribly misused these examples to harm others and to justify their sin, sinful actions. Yeah, you heard me right. They've used these scriptures to justify their sin and mistreatment of others. And I think Paul would be furious for being misquoted. So Paul's three examples of submission were found, bound up all in relationships. First, the relationship between a husband and a wife, the relationship between parents and children, and then between masters and slaves. Now that middle one, parents and children, it's the least controversial. Uh, children are to obey their parents, and parents, especially fathers, are not to act in such a way that causes their children to be forced to disobey or rebel. And most people, they accept this as a great example of mutual submission. But the other two, marriage and slavery, well, those are a bit more complex. And in this video, I want to try to discuss what I think Paul was asking for us to do in marriage. In the next part video, I'll unpack more about Paul's mentioning of slaves and how we understand slavery in the New Testament. But this controversy, this difficulty, has to be talked about and addressed in a careful way. And what sets people off is not as much the verse Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, even though we don't like that. But that's not what sets us up. It's what immediately follows in verse 22 where Paul said, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Women, submit to your husbands. Maybe you're now seeing the problem people have with Paul. So what do we do with this? 
Well, let's start by agreeing to some basic guiding principles. Regardless of your interpretation or whether you agree or disagree with me, I think most of us would agree, though, that our goal is to faithfully follow the teachings of the Bible, even teachings or principles we don't personally like. I think we also agree it's wise to understand the situation in the context of biblical instructions. We want to accurately bring first century ideals into our 21st century while at the same time not imposing our 21st century situation or culture onto the Bible passage. Our goal is to faithfully follow the Word of God in our own time, which is the question. So, Randy, how are we as 21st century Christians to be faithful to the instructions on marriage from Paul and honor the gender roles discussed in Ephesians 5 today? Specifically, the reason why has nothing to do with anything other than this, Ephesians 5.15, so that we could be very careful how we live, not unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. So in arriving at an answer or getting there today, first I'll talk about what, what, why Paul chose these three examples, marriage, raising children, slavery. Then I'll explore what marriage was like during the first century. And after that, we'll talk about biblical submission and discuss what are we to do with this day. So first, why would Paul pick these specific examples? Was it a random choice? No, it wasn't. Uh, Paul purposely chose these examples because they were familiar conversation pieces to the Ephesians. Long before Paul wrote this, the Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote about household codes. Uh, these were instructions on a, how a man, a husband, or a father could live a virtuous life, to be respected, and have a well-ordered, controlled house. You want to guess what three areas he chose to address in his household codes? Yep. Paul's three examples were the exact same ones that Aristotle used. Virtue, a good man, was seen in how he treated his wife, his children, and his slaves. But it wasn't just Aristotle. A lot of other writers at the same time used these same three examples, these household codes, codes as well. So Paul's examples were typical of other writings of the day. But scholars think, and so do I, that there was more to it than just a philosophical convention. Paul used these three examples to show Roman leaders that Christianity itself was a moral and a virtuous religion. So this is going to be new for you, so just kind of hang with me for a second. Because at the same time Christianity was growing in the Roman Empire, other religions were also spreading throughout the empire. And these cults or false religions often called for the overthrow of social customs. Roman women who joined these cults were encouraged to revolt against family norms. They were encouraged to keep secrets from their families and their husbands. And now, as Roman women were becoming Christians, there was a fear that they, like the other cult converts, were trying to undermine moral society. Now, I know this sounds strange to hear, but at the time, some Romans viewed Christianity as immoral and possibly anti-family. At least the Romans did at this period, because of those very reasons. So in Paul's writing, he tried to over-communicate the opposite. Even when his position on gender roles and even slavery itself were some of the most progressive of his time, the preaching of the gospel was more important than societal upheaval. He wanted to make sure Roman leaders had no reason to believe Christians wanted to destroy families or for Romans to have a bad perception about Christianity itself. While Paul does argue that there is now no more slave or free, there is no more Jew or Gentile, there is no more male or female in Christ that all are equal, his radical approach to equality was tempered by the need to preach the gospel first, change society second. So what did marriage look like in the first century for the Ephesians? Well, the church would be in a multicultural experience, a mixture of Gentile and Jewish practices who all brought their ideas and concepts to marriage to this church. There was no one-size-fits-all approach, but it's safe to say that the dominant view of both Roman and Jewish culture was that a husband was the leader over his wife, and the wife was subordinate to the husband. And, and that's pretty consistent in most areas of society at the first century. So it was accepted that a wife was submissive to the husband in this culture. So what does that word submission even mean? 
What sort of expectation did Paul have when he used the term? Paul's instruction for wives to submit themselves to their husbands, well, it wouldn't have been all that controversial. It definitely wouldn't be radical at the time. Remember, this was the accepted custom. To submit oneself probably was understood as to give in or to cooperate. And some point out that it actually rarely means absolute obedience. In fact, Paul himself didn't even say that here. His only qualification or explanation of what he meant by submission in this passage, we read in verse 33. Paul said, however, each of you must also love his wife as he loves, loves himself, and then, further instruction to the wife, the wife must respect her husband. Well, there's a whole lot more going on in these verses to look at, and we'll look at some of that. That verse alone is not all that controversial. Paul asked for husbands to love their wives and wives to respect their husbands. That's a pretty good base for a loving, lasting marriage. And to be clear, while we are jarred in the 21st century with the term submit, Paul was um, rather jarring in the first century for a completely different reason. Paul's instructions are quite, well, weak to ancient standards. See, when Paul talks about submission, in other passages, it's usually about specific groups. He talks about women in Corinthians, Colossians, Timothy, and Titus. He talks about children in 1 Timothy 3, 4. He talks again about slaves in Titus chapter 2. But then he also speaks in terms of submission in our attitude of, as believers to the state in Romans chapter 13 and Titus chapter 3. That's right. The same way a person submits to the authority of the government is the same way that a wife submits to the authority of her husband. Think about that implication for a few minutes. Submission is an important part of society, even if we don't like it. You and I submit to the government. And this submission is beneficial to us. We submit and we're protected by the police. We submit and have roads to travel on from our taxes. We submit and firemen come to put out fires. Submission in that sense makes sense. But in the same way that submission to the government is only necessary when that government does not bring us into conflict with the laws of God. So a spouse is not obligated to follow her husband's leadership if it conflicts with specific scriptural commands. You see, submission does not mean oppression. Submission is not dictatorship or lordship. In fact, Paul told all Christians, including husbands, to submit to each other, which would have included their wives. Submission is not subjugation. To subjugate is to bring under control, to make someone submit. And there's a huge difference between subjugation and submission. When I submit, I place myself under authority. When I am subjugated, I am placed under authority without my will involved. And that was pretty typical of the day. I think Paul was saying, wives, as free, responsible agents, voluntarily place yourself under your husband, submit to his authority since this is entirely proper. And in return, he will submit to you out of love. The parallel is the husband's duty to love his wife. He is commanded to love her. And this is not simply a matter of having affectionate feelings for her or being physically attracted to her. Rather, it involves his unceasing care and loving service for her entire well-being. In Ephesians 5, Paul says Christ's love for the church is to be the model for the husband's love for his wife. Christ-like sacrificial leadership by the husband will keep the ultimate good of his wife in view at all times. Yes, a wife should submit to her husband just as the husband, following Christ's example of self-sacrificial love, must also submit himself to his wife. Now, of note in this passage, is the amount of instruction Paul gives to the men versus the women. Wives are given little explanation, while instructions to the men are way more detailed. Now, this does follow the Greek pattern of teaching on household codes, but there is a stark difference between what Paul wrote and what they wrote. Greek household codes were about authority, control, and consequently about the obedience of the wives. Men were to rule, and men were to be obeyed. And that's not at all what Paul said. He, he surprised his, and he surpassed his current cultural standing 
while doing it in a very delicate way. Remember, this is the same Paul who said that men and women are equal in Ephesians 2 and 4. That was a radical statement of empowerment. Um, Craig Keener, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, explained it this way in his book, Paul, Women, and Wives. And let me read you what he wrote. He said, Paul's argument here is both powerful and well-crafted. If wives submit to their husbands, Roman moralists and others could not claim that Christianity subverted pagan morals. But if the husband also submits and the husband and wife act as equals before God, Paul is demanding something more than Roman moralists typically demanded, not less. Here's what Paul said. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. And he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Paul says this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. If you research this, you'll find people who argue for complete obedience on the part of a wife. That submission includes uh, everything about absolute surrender of will, choice, and leadership in a family. You'll also read others who say that Paul's purpose was not for the husband to dominate, but that in mutual submission, that a true marriage can flourish. So what do you think, Randy? Well, I, I understand Paul. The greater Christ-like position is mutual submission. It's seen in a husband who loves his wife like Christ loved the church, who loves his wife like he loves himself. Far from demanding um, loyalty and absolute obedience, demanding authority and even expecting worship or or some sort of approach that puts the woman lesser than the man. No, just like Jesus, husbands voluntary give, voluntarily give up their rights for the purposes of union with their wife. Remember, Jesus, who was God, gave up the rights and privileges of worship in heaven to come to earth to save humanity. Philippians 2 says Jesus emptied himself of himself. Godly husbands, get this empty themselves of themselves and give up their rights, their privileges, and demands. And then they submit themselves for their wives' benefit. Godly wives voluntarily submit themselves to their husbands with respect and a Christ-like attitude. Why was all this so important? You see, the home, the home was an important part of life and culture during this period, as it is today and actually probably even more than it is today. Your home in the first century was more than just a place that you ate and slept. It was the center of your life. Most likely in the first century, your job was attached to your home or within close proximity. You didn't commute to work. You, you didn't go into the job. When you spent time with friends, you rarely went out to restaurants. You came together and ate. You went to each other's homes. Churches met in homes for worship and prayer. People gathered in their homes because outside at night was not safe. The home would serve as a place for people to know about you and even in this case, your God. People learned about God from you in your home and how you loved inside of your family. You learned a lot about a family and you learned a lot about God inside of a home. Paul taught that gender was irrelevant to your standing before God. Male versus female was not an issue to him. And if early followers of Jesus Christ wanted to listen, their message to be listened to, they had better be living a life that deserved to be listened to. Now, one last important point of Paul's message on marriage that I think often gets missed in the discussion of headship, leadership, and submission. Let's look back again at verse 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. 
and the two will become one. It's really hard to have competing authority structures when we're living in unified oneness. A godly marriage is the mutual submission of selves to no longer have two separate entities, but one united person. That united coming together is achieved not in subjugating authority, but in mutual submission. Thank you.